Hello and welcome to New Center with me, Parikshit Lutra. Here at the US India Business Council India Ideas Summit, one of the big themes this time was India US cooperation in the digital sector and having standards around the use of data. Addressing the gathering, Finance Minister Nirmala Sitaraman flagged global turbulence and uncertainties as major challenges for economies like India and the United States. She also said that the RBI had the capability and was well positioned to manage the economy despite all the global economic challenges. Listen in to what she said about the India-US relationship going forward and how the country is managing inflation. Uh, mutual understanding, particularly at a time when the world is so divided, and the world is so engaged in such activities, which you think who exactly would want these to happen? But it, when it is happening, none of us feel empowered enough to stop it. So we are at very severe challenging times. And therefore, I would think such engagement at this level will only further strengthen common shared values between India and the US. Inflation is not red-lettered. I hope it doesn't surprise many of you all. We have shown that in the last couple of months, uh, we were able to bring it under some manageable levels. Well, speaking at the US IBC India Idea Summit, we also caught up with the Minister of State for Electronics and IT, Rajiv Chandrasekhar. Uh, we asked him uh, about very specific and consistent demands coming from the US uh, for relaxation of data transfer and data localization norms. On that one point, he answered by saying that before uh, the data protection regime is brought into place in the country, there will be extensive consultation done, especially on these provisions of data transfer and data localization. Where on being questioned about how big tech could potentially be uh, a thorn in U.S.-India relations on that. Uh, he responded by saying that the aim and the ambition of the Indian government is in fact to target and to regulate harm, potential harm uh, that may be caused by the internet and online actors. Take a look. It's a big occasion. You mentioned on the dais uh, that this is a trillion dollar opportunity. Uh, what room does that provide for the two countries to participate and partake in this trillion dollar opportunity to cooperate essentially? No, look, I think uh, uh, Mr. Shiv Shivram of Western Digital said it uh, very beautifully. There is a certain inevitability about India's rise and India's progress in the digital economy. And uh, really, it is uh, for the US and India to work together to you know, like I said, there is a real opportunity here, there is a real opportunity to lead the world in innovation and growth. And it is really uh, time now for the U.S. and India to work much, much closer in pursuing this uh, digital economy opportunity. And as uh, Shiva Shivaraman of Western Digital said, there is an inevitability to this growth of India in the digital space. And it is for countries to come together with India and uh, partner with India going forward. So one concern that we've often heard, uh, courtesy uh, platforms such as USIBC, is a need for India to relax some of the data transfer and data localization norms. Is that something that the government is look, looking at? Look, everybody, like I said, I said in the beginning of my conversation that uh, everybody today has a view on uh, all things data. And we will obviously undertake uh, extensive public consultations uh, before we do the new uh, data protection law and indeed the Digital India Act. Uh, but we know what our national interests are. We know what is uh, required for us to grow our economy into a trillion dollar digital economy. And there will be some uh, counterbalancing interests from other countries. We will talk through those. Uh, our interest is not very, very uh, uh, different from what uh, the US wants. Mm -hmm. But there are certain areas that we have to look at, which is digital sovereignty, digital uh, uh, our fundamental right of our Indian citizens to protect their data. So we will see how this evolves. Uh, there is uh, really no. Uh, deal-breaking principle on the table today, but there are many issues and concerns that a natural consultation and natural progress on a conversation will address. You mentioned some outstanding issues. Is big tech regulation one of them? Differing views on either side? Look, I think the whole world is grappling with this issue of how do we make the internet a safe and trusted space. The internet has a tremendous power to do good, as you know. But it also has increasingly become a power to do harm. And you saw the Wikipedia issue two days ago, where you can create a law and order problem. You can incite communities by simply having somebody from across the border edit a Wikipedia page and uh, create mayhem. So there is a real uh, conversation that needs to be had by all like-minded countries about how do we address this issue of user harm on the internet? How do we together 
India, US, Australia, Japan, Singapore, all like-minded countries. How do we make the internet a safe and trusted space for all our citizens? Because in India, in a couple of years, 1.2 billion Indians are going to use the internet. There are going to be pensioners, there are women, there are children, all of whom who use the internet for their daily needs. And so it is imperative and it is a responsibility and moral duty of the government of the day to make the internet a safe and trusted place. And so regulating harm is part of that, not necessarily about big tech alone or small tech. It is necessary for us to create do's and don'ts uh, that make the internet a safe and trusted place. One final question, sir. You mentioned the data protection regime. Can we see it as soon as perhaps the winter session? We will see a very contemporary, very global standard set of laws that basically enable our trillion dollar goal, the Prime Minister's uh, India's decade vision, and uh, protect the rights and interests of all Indian citizens, you will see that at the earliest. Well, the US IBC India Idea Summit also featured a number of corporate titans, uh, notable amongst them being uh, Gautam Adani. He was also the recipient of the Global Leadership Award. He spoke of how uh, there is great synergy between the two countries, the two large democracies, uh, that there is, in fact, common ground and geopolitical concerns, and that that is something that the private sector can build upon. In fact, speaking specifically on the semiconductor issue, he said that India can no longer be dependent on the global supply chain, that there is increasing uh, semiconductor nationalism, that India needs to guard against that and towards that end that India is positioned well uh, with a very large engineering pool and that it's uh, time now for India to in fact take on the mantle of even fabricating semiconductors here locally. Uh, but he was just one amongst the very many corporate uh, icons uh, that were here as a part of the US IBC summit. Let's take a look. While negotiators from both our countries have struggled to reach a deal on a trade package and tariffs, I believe we are closer than ever before to address the open matters. I am confident we will resolve this and mutually accept some compromises. What we cannot afford is to remain stuck in the belief that all aspects of trade and relations are being hampered as a result of tariffs. The semiconductor industry is a classic example with more engineers deployed in India than anywhere in the world. And yet, India has no semiconductor plan. India cannot remain dependent on global supply chains that are based on semiconductor nationalisms and will need U.S. support. Over the last decade plus, the relationship between U.S. and India has grown tremendously um, in the defense side. I think defense trade now stands at over $21 billion. And so from very humble beginnings, the uh, relationship has really ratcheted up, not only in terms of defense trade, but also in the mill-to-mill -mill exercises in the, the quad formation and, and, and therefore the, the quad partners were actually doing the Malabar exercises, for example, even before the quad was formed. So I think the trajectory is uh, one of convergence and one of increased opportunities as we look at many common threats and the geopolitics uh, that surround us okay. uh, with uh, co many common interests. So I do think that the trajectory of the defense relationship is going to go north. Okay. Uh, also to ask you about a deal which has now been in the works for five to six years. This is about the predator armed drones uh, for the for the Indian Defence Forces. We we hear from the we hear from reports and from government sources that this is now in advanced stages of negotiations. Uh, where do you think we are heading with this deal? Uh, and if it goes through, how soon would you be able to deliver on it? So um, this, as you rightly said, is a government-to-government -government discussion that's been ongoing. And we, as General Atomics, stand by to support India in uh, the requirements. Uh, as you know, the MQ-9B is uh, the latest and greatest um, uh, technology and a unique technology um, globally. And uh, it's served. Uh, the intent is to serve the Army, the Air Force, and the Indian Navy. 
and I think um, this capability enhances not only the national security of India, but as well as the uh, joint convergence of the relationship and the oper operationalization of many of the foundational agreements that both the countries have signed. Right. How optimistic would you be of uh, this deal going through soon? So again, I'd refer that to the governments um, because they're in discussions. All right. Uh, also to ask you about uh, the the two Sea Guardian drones that were leased to the Indian Navy, that lease was extended. How has uh, been the collaboration with the Indian Navy uh, with those two Sea Guardian drones? It has been outstanding from what we hear from the customers that they're extremely pleased with the performance of these two drones. The, the, these uh, unmanned aircraft have performed a series of operational missions that are of national security interest. Uh, and uh, from what I understand that the um, performance has been outstanding. Right. Uh, in terms of manufacturing in India, transferring technology to uh, the Indian government, what is your view on that? So the defense relationship, as I, I mentioned, has matured a lot over the last uh, decade plus. And uh, you see some of the best capabilities and platforms. And you see increased amounts of investments into the Indian ecosystem by American companies of creating um, various aspects, whether it is maintenance, uh, repair, overhaul, uh, training, logistics. And I think that trajectory is going to continue to increase because there's shared interest um, in creating you know, economies of scale at, a, and uh, joint operations in many of these uh, areas. Right. Uh, my final question would be, uh, today there's a lot of focus on indigenization in defense in India, even when it comes to drones, for example. So looking at the defense manufacturing sector in India and the push towards indigenization, any key asks that you have of the Indian government, uh, any areas which you feel that need to be eased up for making it easier for companies like yours to do business? I think the government, I must congratulate, has put in a set of very robust policies. Uh, the Prime Minister has uh, really put in some excellent policies in place with the PLI schemes, etc. And I think uh, it, the frameworks are all there and it's a matter of executing to those frameworks. As you can see, we are going through a very dynamic phase in the world affairs. The war, the geopolitical issues, the coming out of the pandemic, all are causing turbulence in the marketplace. Whatever we were doing pre-pandemic, we haven't quite returned back to where we were before. There are some places we are above, some cases we are below. The supply chain uh, disruptions are slowly coming to an end. But put all this together, there are inventory corrections, there are slowdown in specific sectors. For example, when the China COVID shutdown happened, cell phone sales went down. Cryptocurrency collapsed and there are processors and, and uh, those kinds of electronic things that are needed for crypto mining have collapsed. But secularly, however, data, data related uh, industries over time are still poised for growth. Mm -hmm. In the long term, the growth of data is 30-35% compounded year over year. Mm -hmm. So in the end, when you have to store it, network it, process it, you are going to see the return of this over the long term. All right. Uh, to ask about how you would like to expand your footprint uh, in India, what are the growth opportunities do you see? In general, India offers some very exciting opportunities. Clearly, the growing middle class. You can see even in the middle of the, the turbulence around the world, India is one of those steady growth regions. We are continuing to see this 8% plus minus growth here. And given that growth and given the growing middle class and the enormous increase in data consumption per capita in India allows us all a opportunity to come back, whether it is in big data center related applications or in client applications where end users are using it or in consumer applications. There are many, many, many opportunities in India that we are interested in. Okay. My final two questions. Uh, 
many countries are considering a China plus one strategy. Uh, how important do you think this moment is for India? And uh, what are some of the factors that countries, uh, that companies would keep in mind while trying, trying to transfer their supply chains from China to other countries? The supply chain strategies that worked for the long term earlier on were clearly shown to be not so uh, probable to use in, 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 in the, in, during the pandemic. For instance, just in time did not work. You could see that concentration when, when one country shut down for the pandemic, oh my God, what do we do? My critical supply just went away. Mm -hmm. Even in a certain region, it is hard. When, when there was a wave of, of pandemic closures that happened from one country, next country, next country, it still affects the entire. Shipping was a very big issue. When airlines stopped, mm -hmm. when passengers were not flying along with it, it used to be cargo space, that went away. Containers end up getting stuck in one side. So you saw all this and now we come back and say, you know what, I have to seriously rethink how I optimize my supply footprint. Critical supply as opposed to things that I need to keep in bulk to make this work. We are thinking about all this very, very carefully. Where we should do it. Where are our consumers? Where are our customers? Where is the availability of talent? Where is the availability of raw materials? Where is the availability of proper government support? Mm -hmm. These all have to be factored when we choose how we re-optimize our supply chain. All right, any areas uh, of concern that you're working with the Indian government on? Indian government has been very good in or, general. Or maybe one reform that the Indian government must do. Bureaucracy in general in India is something that we can do a little bit more. Uh, reforming of. There is a lot that has changed. There is a lot that has gotten better. But still, that last mile has to be improved in making the bureaucracy a little bit less onerous than it is today. Well, on that note, it's time to head into a very short break. But do stay with us. On the other side, we'll get you plenty more uh, from the US IBC India Ideas Summit. That's up on the other side. Welcome back. You are watching News Center. What is the future of Indo-US trade talks? How will India and the United States cooperate in the Indo-Pacific economic framework? To answer all these questions and much more, we caught up with USIBC President Atul Kashyap. Listen in. Uh, and I think it's entirely important that the United States and India, as two countries that benefit from a high trust ecosystem, build that high trust ecosystem. In the op-ed that's in the Hindustan Times today, I argued that the need is urgent, that we ought to figure out what the rules of the road are for the digital economy of the 21st century. Our companies dominate the digital economy. There's going to be enormous growth in what America and India do together. And I believe that we can build a framework for human freedom that preserves data privacy, that ensures economic growth, that allows for startups and for uh, uh, innovation to thrive. I think we should do that. And if we do that right, we're going to hit our $500 billion target for trade in goods and services. Right. Uh, some of the market access issues that U.S. companies face in India, would you like to list them out for us, key barriers to trade which should be addressed? So I think this is where we have to have a respectful conversation in both uh, directions and be constructive about what can be achieved. Mm. Uh, I think a lot of people in the United States, American companies, American investors, American people, have enormous faith in India's rise through the entire 21st century. India is going to grow and grow and grow. It could become a $30 trillion economy. And so getting the rules and standards right is really important. Mm. If we can create a high trust data corridor between the United States and India, it is going to unlock and unleash so much innovation and potential and growth. So we can certainly focus on the issues. There are issues in both directions. Uh, ours are too pluralistic and messy democracies. They have many, many constituencies. But I think as friends, we can work through a lot. I'd also like to ask you about the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework. The Commerce Minister, uh, Piyush Goyal, is traveling to the United States right now, and this would be a key agenda item. How do you see this moving forward? Does USIBC have a blueprint for the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework? So my view on this is that for the first time in the Indo-Pacific, the United States and India find themselves in the, sta in the same strategic and economic baskets, the Quad on one hand and the IPEF, Indo-Pacific Economic Framework, on the other. 
The Indo-Pacific Economic Framework is embryonic. You know, our governments have made a conscious decision that they want to talk to each other and be together with other like-mindeds to build the future of trade and investment and commerce in the Indo-Pacific. Mm -hmm. So my shloka, if you will, is that from tiny acorns, mm -hmm. mighty oak trees can grow. And I think that as, as long as, as our two governments look at it in a collaborative and cooperative way, we can build that high trust ecosystem. Speaking about the 5G rollout in India, it's all set to begin now. Do you see this as a potential area of cooperation? Absolutely. Yeah. First of all, it's and a, what is the level of interest? Yeah, Parikshit, first of all, it's a very impressive achievement by India, building out the 5G stack, as impressive uh, as the UPI stack that is really quite remarkable to see. Mm -hmm. I think our um, technology companies, our IT companies, mm -hmm. our fintech companies, our digital companies are fascinated by all of the innovations, innovations and changes that are happening in India. 5G is of course extraordinarily sensitive technology because it involves a lot of data privacy. I think free countries, free countries need to work together to ensure that privacy is ensured and that technology offers the most choices to consumers and that frankly we know who has custody of that data. Also to speak to you about the startup story in India, we're looking at large scale layoffs, a slowdown in investments into the startup ecosystem and companies delaying their IPO plans. So how does USIBC see the India startup story? We've had very good conversations with the entire uh, uh, Indian uh, policy infrastructure on this. So keeping that going is very important. It has a great impact on American companies as well who want to work with them. And I think that's where GDP grows, right? Uh, we want to see India be a 10 and 20 and 30 trillion dollar economy. Startups are how you're going to do it. What we'd like to do is to be able to invest more easily in them, to be able to uh, uh, list them or delist them as case may be to help scale them and improve them. Uh, I think they would appreciate investor money coming in. Uh, and of course, critically keeping the uh, regulatory uh, ecosystem and structure such that they can continue to thrive. Right. Uh, there have been concerns among US companies on the regulation of big tech companies in India. Uh, the parliamentary committee is also looking at it, something that the government is also looking at it at the highest level on how to regulate the flow of data, use of data, the kind of fees which are charged by some of these uh, big tech companies. Uh, also, uh, the treatment to companies like Walmart and Amazon, uh, Google, for example. So how do you see this and how does this come up in the conversation with the Indian government? I think my appeal would be that we should not view each other as adversaries. Uh, American companies are respectful, they're ethical, they bring the absolute highest standards of managerial and technological excellence. They are the catalyst for quicker growth in any ecosystem where they go, in any economy where they go. I think they can be a catalyst of India's growth to 10 and 20 and 30 trillion dollars. So let's see how we can work together, not as adversaries, but as friends. Already when you look at your companies and our companies, they're hiring across the geographies for innovation that is seamless in both time zones. That's the future. All right, uh, on that note, we come to the end of this broadcast. Thank you for watching and goodbye.